Coming up on Garden Talk. Once you learn about the soul food web and how the system works, it's self-perpetuating. So as long as you have the key ingredients, which is organic matter, some type of mineral, macro, and micronutrient base to it, the system is self-automated to kind of run on its own. If you're looking at a really healthy system versus just dirt, you really start to notice the difference in biology between what a healthy system has included in its biology versus dirt. You mostly just find mineral particles and bacteria. If your system goes too anaerobic, and you start producing large amounts of alcohols, which is a byproduct, your alcohol and a root system will actually liquefy your roots. It brings more diversity into your soil system. So having kind of a mixed bag of all the different kinds of predatory species is really important. What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, AKA Mr. Grow It and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 70. In this episode, I interview Kay the Guy. He is certified through Dr. Elaine Ingham's Soil Food Web School and has extensive knowledge in soil biology. Today, we're gonna get into a small handful of topics that relate to soil biology, the soil food web, microbes, and composting. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Mr. Grow It. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to Mars Hydro for sponsoring this episode. Mars Hydro has an official partnership with Samsung and uses their Samsung LM301B diodes in their FC6500 and FC8000 LED grow lights. These fixtures provide an average 1000 micromoles per meter square per second PPFD in a 4x4 grow space, which makes it very suitable for commercial growers. Both LED grow lights provide a uniform power output, so the light is spread evenly across the coverage area. Check out their website at mars-hydro.com and you can use the discount code Mr. Grow it for a discount on any of their products. Big shout out to AC Infinity for sponsoring this podcast. AC Infinity is well known to produce high quality products and provide excellent customer service. They have the thickest grow tent on the market today, inline vans with a controller that can automatically turn on and off according to specific set points. They have seedling mats, trimmers, drying racks, and several other products that you can use in your garden. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code Mr. Grow it during checkout for a discount on their products. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Kay the Guy. How you doing today? Pretty good, man. Today we're going to get into a small handful of topics that relate to soil biology. So first thing we're going to go over is the soil food web. We actually haven't had, I think we had like one other guest kind of touch upon the soil food web a little bit, but they didn't really get into many details. And I think the soil food web is super important. So I'm really excited to have you on to talk in detail about that. Uh, We're also going to get into uh, microbes, really deep into some of the microbes and their functions, which is very important when it comes to living soil. And then if we have time, we will get into composting. I love talking to people who are into composting, who have knowledge on it, because I am somewhat new of a composter. I mean, I've been doing it for about like eight or nine months now. So like, I love to have people on and like pick their brain from my own personal gain. So so yeah, we'll uh, we'll get into those things and then uh, and then we'll go from there. But first, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Uh, so I'm Kay the Guy. I have a YouTube channel and a small Instagram channel. Um, I grow, uh, build and fix things on my YouTube channel. So it's a big DIY channel. Um, I am certified through the soul food web, uh, through their FC courses, as well as uh, their certified lab tech program, which I basically do biological lab assessments and analysis on, uh, different kinds of, um, microbial populations and certain soil systems and samples I get sent in, um, or to test on my own personal property. I'm also certified by Green Flower Academy for their uh, medicinal plant uh, cultivation certificate. So I also have that as well. Um, I got started really uh, uh, full-time gardening in 2018, uh, moving to the property I currently live at, um, which we're blessed to have 10 acres here. And so it's 
at first I was excited and, and then I realized how much work 10 acres is really to cultivate. And so I've been doing it uh, bits and pieces at a time. Uh, back in 2018, the U.S. Farm Bill uh, was signed into law after a 48-year prohibition on uh, hemp. So after that, uh, it was federally legal. And in 2019 and 2020, I had a hemp uh, cultivation license through the state of Colorado. Um, and that's where I learned a lot of uh, growing medicinal plants and how that process works. I did a lot of stumbling my first year and uh, uh, killed some plants. I, I really didn't know what I was doing. And, um, but I also was able to get plants through to harvest. So I was successful at least in that first year to do that. Um, and then after that, uh, every year I, I tried to grow, uh, my education as well as my knowledge and wisdom for growing, not just medicinal plants, but several different kinds of species of plants and trees. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I've checked out your YouTube channel and I feel like you have one of the most un underrated channels out there. You have a lot of great information and definitely anybody who's tuning into this that wants to learn more about, you know, you have a whole bunch of variety of different gardening topics on there. I don't want to say it's just, it's just one thing, but uh, I'll definitely have a link to his YouTube channel down in the description section below. Head on over there, check out his videos, give him a subscription. And if you're tuning in on one of the podcast platforms, just search for his name, K the guy, and his channel will come up there. I definitely think a lot of you will enjoy his videos. It gives a lot of valuable content there. So there are so many different styles of gardening, right? There's so many different ways to grow. What's your style? Are you an indoor grower, outdoor? What medium are you in? Are you growing with synthetic nutrients or organic inputs? What's your style? So um, when I first started, I had to start indoors because our winters are pretty harsh. Um, so I had to start our little baby plants um, in an indoor grow area that I, that I built. Um, so I had to learn about you know, different lighting. Um, I started with essentially fluorescent lighting, just something really basic. And now I've, I've all the way advanced up to chill tech, um, for our lighting systems. Um, but I grow indoor, uh, typically during the winter months and I, and then I grow outdoor, um, during the summer months, uh, when it's warmer. So it's, it's kind of a mixture of both. Um, I started off doing a lot of synthetics and, um, that was, for me, that was more challenging than, than switching over to organics. Um, organics, once you learn about the soil food web and how the system works, um, it's, it's self-perpetuating. So as long as you have the key ingredients, which is organic matter, um, some type of mineral macro and micronutrient base to it, the system is self-automated in order to kind of run on its own. Uh, indoors, I use, um, earth boxes and grassroots pots. Uh, which are really good for me. Um, I like it because uh, with an earth box, I can just fill it with three to 5,000 mils of water and I can, I can go take a vacation for five days. And so it's kind of hands-free. I don't have to worry about the uh, medium getting too wet because it's essentially a bottom fed water system. So when the top gets too wet, um, then you end up going slightly anaerobic or your environment gets a little too wet. And then you end up with situations like fungus gnats or those kinds of situations where now you're battling something cause your environment got slightly out of whack. So I really do like that bottom fed, um, uh, earth box systems for indoor, especially. Yeah. The automated systems for like the automated watering systems can be so beneficial. I mean, it saves time. It helps with the, uh, the right moisture content in the medium, which is super important. That's hard to really dial in when you're hand watering. So I have a, uh, automatic watering system as well. I have the blue mat system and I've used the auto pots in the, in the past. And I think AC infinity, not sure if they've revealed this yet and they might <laughs> get mad at me for revealing it, but they actually have an auto watering system in the nice. works or actually it might actually already be released at this point. Uh, so I I'm looking forward to trying that one out as well, but is it going to be a top fed or is it a bottom fed system or a drip system? Do you know? Bottom fed. Yep. It's starting from the bottom and wicks up. Yeah, I like those kinds of systems because then your 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 top surface never really gets over soaked for the most part. Yeah, it can be beneficial. The only downside is like I've used the 
auto pots before and when I'm doing top dressing keeping that top layer is kind of difficult at times because the wicking doesn't really keep that top layer truly sure. moist and you know as you know we need to keep that top layer moist with the amendments in there so the biology can break it down and turn it into usable nutrients for the plant so but yeah I love those systems it definitely makes things a lot easier let's get into the soil food web so tell us what is the soil food web so essentially, the soil food web is a discovery um, made by Dr. Elaine over the past 40 to 50 years of research. That discovery is essentially how uh, plants receive the soluble nutrients through the flow or cycle of organisms uh, around the roots of the plants through predation. So in the soil food web school curriculum, uh, what we learn is essentially the history of, of all this research, decades of research that Dr. Elaine has done going to different continents and regions around the world and perceiving what the organisms in the soil are doing and, and, and what the, the base life forms, which essentially are our bacteria and our fungi, are, are being consumed by these predatory species. And what she would notice over the course of time is that there was certain groups that were always consistent in every soil medium throughout the world. And so what she created was more or less a flow chart of understanding the base life forms that need to be present, which are our prey in the system. Um, what they do is uh, bacteria and fungi, they create enzymes that break down parent uh, minerals of sand, silts, and clay in the soil around different regions of the world. And essentially what they do as they're breaking down those minerals, a predatory species will come along and will consume those creatures and then release the excess nutrients into the soil system. And that's how uh, nature has done it for years and years, or eons really, uh, without the help of human assistance to perpetuate uh, productive uh, plant growth. Okay, gotcha. And then for some of these microorganisms that you mentioned, bacteria, fungi, we'll go over protozoa, nematodes, you can't see them with the naked eye, right? They're micro. Micro stands for, you need, you need a microscope for it. Yeah. What are the different types of microscopes and which microscopes do you recommend? So we have um, a real basic microscope that we use for the soil food web. Um, right now we use a shadowing parafocal microscope, uh, which is the one right behind me on my shoulder here. Um, these are fairly uh, uh, inexpensive, um, kind of the same ones that you see in high schools or college labs. Um, there's really nothing super special to them. They have essentially illumination in the bottom, a condenser. Um, usually you'll have at least three object objectives to a microscope. You'll have a four, a 40 and a 400 total magnification. Uh, the four we typically use will kind of scan around and actually find nematodes at, uh, uh, essentially four X. Um, we'll use the, uh, 40 for, um, identifying uh, large, larger creatures within our soil systems. And then we'll go up to 400 to look at bacteria, um, which is the base measurement to what we use to measure all the other creatures. So whenever we're looking at um, all the different organisms under our microscope, uh, one particular bacteria called a cocci, which is essentially just a little round, um, little round kind of blob, is uh, one micrometer in diameter. So we use that as a kind of a, a base measurement to measure everything else in our fields of view. And then I don't want to get too off topic here, but one of the things with microscopes that I know that you can do is I kind of want to talk about DNA sex testing. Just a quick question in regards to that is like, mm -hmm. I know in order to find out if a plant is male or female, you can actually use a microscope to zoom all the way in and see the chromosomes and then identify if the plant is male or female. Can that microscope that you have, can you zoom in that far and see that? The current microscope I have goes up to a thousand power in total magnification. There might be a way, but I'd have to, I would have to recognize, uh, what the distinctive, uh, differences in those chromosomes are in order to recognize between male and female. Uh, I probably could, but um, I'd have to set up specifically in order to do that on this microscope. Again, this is a real basic microscope that goes uh, between a four and a hundred X objective. And so um, being able to, to use it for other things uh, is definitely possible. Um, it, it, it's kind of fun because you, you get the microscope, you start 
really looking at slides and those kinds of things. And you kind of get lost at first because you don't really know exactly what you're looking at in the very beginning. Um, it's just really exploration. And what you'll start to notice is, you know, the differences between, for example, if you're looking at a really healthy system versus just dirt, uh, you really start to notice the difference in biology between what a healthy system has included in its biology versus dirt. You mostly just find mineral particles and bacteria. So I've been wanting to get a microscope. Uh, when I did my research, I seen ones that were like thousands of dollars and I'm like, Ugh, do I really want to make that investment right now? And then I came across your videos and you posted a link to the microscope that you have. And I was surprised to see that it was only, it was only like what, $300 at the most or something like that. I know you have yeah. to get like the slides and, and things like that, but we're looking at less than 500 bucks for everything, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Probably around $400 in total, um, depending on how prices get. But um, yeah, you basically just need a, um, a shadowing microscope that has up to 400x magnification for what I do. Um, and then you need your test tubes, your pipettes for drawing your liquid. Um, you need your, uh, your slides and then your cover slips uh, in order to do your viewing of all your different micros microscope analysis. But yeah, you can use it for lots of different things as well. Nice. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to pick one of those up for sure. So when you're looking at the microscope, you can look at different particles. You know, there, there's sand, there's silt, and there's clay. And you kind of already touched upon like dirt. Uh, maybe get a little bit deeper into dirt versus soil. But explain to us what those things are. So uh, sand, silt, and clay, and then combined together, which is a loam, um, is essentially the base or parent materials to what the Earth's crust is. And included in all those um, different materials is all the different elements uh, based on Dr. Lane's research that are, um, once they're plant soluble, are able to be taken up by the plant to grow any kind of plant in any kind of region around the world. Some chemists or agronomists will argue against this, um, but depending on how deep your root system goes, you can have obviously more and more available nutrients the deeper your system goes into the ground. So if they're just testing the first, you know, top six inches or 12 inches of a soil medium, uh, they're going to get a certain uh, test using a malic three or a saturated paste test of what your chemistry is in your soil. But if your plant's root system goes down four feet, then there's a whole nother set of, of tests that has to be done to see exactly what we're trying to get. And so um, the differences between sand, salt, and clay, obviously when, when you're in uh, uh, areas that's closer to the ocean, uh, you may see more uh, sand. Uh, again, sand is um, easily drained, but um, it's hard to bring together aggregates. So when you're looking at the difference between what you would consider dirt or nothing growing in a sand medium, um, it, it's, it's basically all just minerals. So once you get that uh, swing where you get organic material back into sand, it starts to turn into a loam. Once you get the organic material coupled with the sand in that particular growing medium, then you're, you're starting to build aggregation because of the, the uh, microbes that are being added with the organic material. So people wonder where microbes essentially come from. Microbes are coming from uh, the organic material that we're adding or is being dropped into those um, soil um, environments. And so you don't necessarily have to go look for them really that hard. You just need to go find systems that are thriving within your area to bring that into a devoid, uh, um, devoid of organisms um, environment in order to, to kind of re replenish all that life to get the, the system turned on again. Okay. And then to see this stuff through the microscope, we're not going to get real detailed into how to use a microscope in this episode. Although on your channel, you have a video that's you go deep into how to use a microscope, what to look for, so on and so forth. So I won't take that away from you. If anybody wants to get deeper into that, definitely check out his channel because he has very detailed videos on all of those things. Let's flip it up. Let's get into some of the microorganisms at this point. How about we start with bacteria? Can you talk to us all about bacteria? So yeah, bacteria is super important. Uh, bacteria is the one of the base life forms within our soil structure. Um, they are the prey to all, pretty much all the predators within the system. So um, there are 
um, different kinds of bacteria depending on your oxygen levels within your system. So the two main aerobic ones are going to be cocci and bacilli. Cocci are that round, um, uh, almost like a little blob, but they look like a dot. So whenever we're measuring them, it's almost like the tip of a pen. Bacilli is essentially a, a pill-shaped bacteria, and it kind of looks like a little rod. Um, it's usually um, two to three times larger than cocci. Um, but these are the aerobic creatures that we want to see in our soil mediums. These are our food for all the predatory species. These are also the base organisms that are going to use their enzymes to break down all the uh, sand, silts, and clay into plant-available nutrients. So those are very important. Um, we have three levels of oxygen that we measure when it comes to the kinds of bacteria that we want to see and the ones that we don't. And so the three levels are aerobic which is anything above six parts per million of oxygen. And so um, whenever we know that we have an aerobic system, we'll see a lot of cocci and a lot of bacilli. Um, whenever we go into lower oxygen levels, what they call facultative, um, that is between four to six parts per million. And that is where, uh, unfortunately, you start to see disease causers or pathogenic uh, bacteria. Um, this is where... Um, you're going to see spirochetes, spirillum, uh, E. coli is in this range, um, as well as uh, some other kind of nasty things that will make you sick. Um, below that is uh, anaerobic, which is below four, four parts per million. And when you're getting uh, that anaerobic where you have that limited amount of oxygen, um, in certain conditions you are going to start to see uh, really, really bad organisms, uh, typically like vibrios, which are a kidney bean shape. Sometimes they have a little tail on the end of them. And those are, for example, I, I, when I was doing my final exam for um, my microscopy test, um, my examiner was a, a former lab tech that was testing infectious disease and blood samples and those kinds of things. And she said in the presence of vib vibrios, um, you'll see situations like cholera, um, so definitely really uh, uh, unsavory uh, organisms that you don't want to come in contact with. And if you do, obviously you want to clean everything as much as possible. Is there any way that we can measure what the oxygen level is? Like you mentioned those couple different methods uh, or a couple different levels. Is there any way like the home gardener can see that or do they just look at a sample under a microscope and see the different types of bacteria and then can just assume the levels at that point? So if, if you're really not versed on using a, um, a microscope, um, there's a couple of things that you can do to um, understand when a system is going septic, where those things are starting to proliferate. Um, smell, if you're getting any kind of s uh, septic smell, um, that is a, an indication that things are going south. Um, if you detect something like that, you're probably oversaturated with water and your oxygen levels are dropping. So you want to reoxygenate those kinds of situations. You want to get air in there as much as possible. Um, you want to stop the, the flow of water into those areas so that you're uh, slowing or drying off the, the amount of uh, moisture in there and allowing oxygen to kind of reintroduce. Because they'll even if they start to pro proliferate in those situations, um, you can kind of steer it back in the other direction by just adding in oxygen back in immediately. So letting things dry out, moving things around so you're not getting so much uh, moisture in one specific area, um, but typically smell. Um, like for example, if you're uh, composting um, meats and you have that rotten uh, putrid smell, that's putrescine that's actually being formed on uh, meats. Um, and essentially putrescine is a byproduct of rotting flesh. So um, there's all these different chemicals that have different smells based on what is de decomposing uh, at that time and what's um, decomposing it, which is usually some um, can be some nasty creatures. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, I know when you come into anaerobic conditions, particularly like in the root zone, the roots really kind of destroy themselves. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of a root that has just been underwater and there's been anaerobic conditions around the root, but they'll actually, if you cut open a root, you'll see like the cells are just all like destroyed and mm -hmm. the plant is basically just trying to uh, get oxygen, suck up oxygen 
through it. And so it destroys itself and, and uh, there's a hole, there's like a massive hole in the root uh, versus where there should be individual cells. So mm-hmm. it really does some damage on the root zone as well. If, if your system goes too anaerobic and you start producing um, large amounts of alcohols, which is a byproduct, um, your alcohol and a root system will actually liquefy your roots. So you want to make sure that you're not getting too anaerobic because that byproduct is actually uh, the opposite of what you want in your soil and in rhizosphere for your roots. The other point I wanted to make on the three different levels of oxygen is that when you're getting into the different kinds of bacteria, aerobic bacteria will actually produce alkalines um, and glue structures. So when you have aerobic bacteria in your soil system or your compost, whatever you're trying to propagate, it's actually going to increase pH um, and actually create glues to help create aggregates. And those aggregates are what essentially form the colonies of where all your uh, microbes are going to hang out. It also creates a water holding capacity. Uh, It is also an area where you're going to get a lot of uh, organisms that are going to be breaking down things closer to your root system. Um, It also helps with drought resistance as well. So whenever water goes through a certain system and there's really aerobic uh, bacteria through that system, the water will essentially get held within that that portion where a lot of aerobic bacteria are being held and propagating. So it has a lot of benefits to it. But again, according to pH, aerobic bacteria will bring the pH slightly up. Anaerobic bacteria will produce acidic conditions or pH down, um, typically below 4.5. So if you're starting to get anaerobic, your pH is starting to drop, and obviously that's going to affect your plant's ability to take up certain nutrients. So not only is anaerobic bad for the root system, but now your plant can't take up certain things because of the fact that it's too wet um, or anaerobic or low in oxygen in that system. Now, when it comes to fungi, uh, aerobic fungi will produce acidic conditions, but with a a, a fairly neutral variance. So aerobic fungi will produce uh, pH levels between 5.5 and 7. So when you have... uh, bacteria that's bringing your pH up, your, your balance of fungi will actually bring your pH back down and help keep it more neutral. So and in essence, aerobic fungi and aerobic bacteria are balancing each other out to keep uh, kind of the perfect pH for uh, most of the plants that we're going to be growing. Uh, and then lastly, uh, anaerobic fungi um, or omycetes, as we like to call them, uh, they're going to produce highly acidic conditions and, again, pushing the pH below typically a 5.5. Wow, I didn't know that. That's uh, pretty interesting. I know we've talked about on this podcast before how different things adjust the pH. And there's a lot of new growers that are listening in and they, they monitor the pH of their medium because we know it needs to be in a certain range for proper nutrient uptake. And there's a lot of panic that happens because people are doing a runoff test or a slurry test and they're seeing that their pH is out of range and they wonder what is doing that. And they all, a lot of people just think that it's the water that they're putting in is the only thing impacting the pH, which is incorrect. There are so many different things that impact the pH and you just mentioned one of the things there. So definitely glad you brought that up because I wasn't even aware of that. Let's move on to fungi. You already touched upon it a little bit. Can you talk to us more about fungi? So uh, fungi, 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 a lot of people say it different ways. I just repeat what Dr. Elaine says, but um, they are essentially the carbon gatherers to our system. So when you're talking about just making a healthy system worldwide, you want more fungi because they are essentially gathering more carbon than bacteria do. Their structures are long. Sometimes uh, they're huge fields, just uh, all an interconnected fungi system. And they have a much wider carbon to nitrogen ratio. So they essentially are gathering up lots of different types of more complex foods within our system uh, as opposed to bacteria, which have a much narrower carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so um, there are essentially two types that we really um, are searching for uh, when it comes to fungi in our system. We want mycorrhizal or sacrophilic. Uh, mycorrhizal obviously pairs with the root system of other plants and sacrophilic uh, essentially grows on its own. So the thing about fungi that really um, will help you grow almost any kind of plant is that there is a successional series of 
the ratio between fungal biomass and bacterial biomass that will dictate what kind of plant will naturally or grow really well in that system. Um, when you are fairly devoid of fungi in a system, mainly, you know, bacteria is present, you're going to see a lot of, um, weeds growing in that system or early successional plants. When you have a lot of like, uh, for example, actinobacteria, which is a long chain bacteria, it's technically facultative, but, uh, it's a really good bacteria that you want to see under your microscope. If you're going to grow early successional plants like broccoli, coal, or kale. Um, so if you plan on doing something like that in a garden system, you want some of that early successional bacteria, a little bit of that facultative bacteria will also help those plants as well. When you start to further on later in succession, when you're going from the different, uh, so we have different, uh, um, successional plants, you have weeds, and then you have early successional grasses, you have mid to late successional grasses like meadows, and then you have row crops, which is where you get into your corn, your wheat, the things that we do for production. And then from that point, you're getting into uh, shrubs and smaller trees, and then all the way to uh, full tree systems. And then the very end is old growth uh, forest where you're going to see bacteria, excuse me, fungal to bacterial ratios of, of at least three to one or higher. And in those systems, typically the biomass of, of bacteria and fungi is much, much higher than what you see in early successional. So a lot more of the bacteria and fungi, and then a higher ratio of fungi in those older systems. Lots of great information there. You're on a roll with, uh, with this good info. Let's just move on to the next one, getting right into protozoa. Talk to us about that. Uh, so protozoa are a species of organisms that we really want to see in our system, mainly because protozoa consume the most amount of bacteria per day, typically 10,000 bacteria per day that a protozoan will consume. So they're one of the highest consumers of bacteria, which again is going to release most of those uh, nutrients, the excess nutrients into our soil systems. So they're extremely important when it comes to our calculations. Uh, the three main ones that we're looking for, the three main groups of uh, protozoa we're looking for are number one, flagellates, which they are um, fairly small. They're almost kind of hard to see because they, they move around constantly and they bumble around from spot to spot. They don't really have any kind of specific movement. It looks like a little pinball uh, machine in the shape of like a, almost looks like a little mouse sometimes because it's kind of, it has that like oval shape and a little tail to usually on the front of the back. And they're looking around for their favorite bacteria to jump on an aggregate and just start consuming all those kinds of things. Uh, we love seeing flagellates. They're fairly small. They're usually five to 15 micrometers in diameter. Um, and, um, fun to watch, fun to see them. So we do count those when we're doing our assessments. Amoeba, which is, uh, essentially three species of amoeba. Um, there's one, which is our cellas, which look like a big, uh, brown, uh, round donut, uh, really. Um, they're fairly large. When you see them, they just look like this round blob, uh, under your microscope. They're, they're again, they're, they're, they're quite large when you see them, usually three to four times the size of a, of a flagellate. And they, they have, uh, essentially an outer circle and then an inner circle. And the inner circle is actually their mouth. And they just kind of like, uh, they, they float around in the system, like a basking, a basking shark, just with their mouth open, just waiting for things to just float in there as they consume it. Uh, test and, and our cellas are a, a type of testate amoeba. Um, the other kind of amoeba, which is specifically a testate amoeba, um, they have, uh, they're about half the size, maybe a third of the size of an arcella. They have an egg shape to their body. And then they have a test on the, on the end, which looks like a flat part, which is where their mouth parts are. Um, they'll typically have these little tentacles, uh, from their mouthpieces that they'll reach out and kind of swim around and they'll, they'll grab bacteria and bring it into their mouth parts. Um, and these are the ones that we, we like to see cause they're just constantly consuming. They don't move around that much. Our cellos or testate amoebas, they just kind of sit there for the most part. If you really watch them for like, 
like 20 minutes. Sometimes I'm sitting there watching them. Um, you'll see them slowly reach out a tentacle and just start bringing all this bacteria into their body. Um, the last one, uh, which is uh, pseudopods or naked amoebas. Uh, these have no particular structure. At first, it's hard to see them or find them because they're just a blob. And um, they ooze along and their body structures will change in different shapes. And so one part will go over here and grab some bacteria and then it'll, it'll, it'll go in another direction. Another, uh, uh, round looking appendage will come out from another direction. And they're really cool to watch. Uh, they're about the size of a test date amoeba, a little bit smaller. Um, but again, that's another one that we count when we're counting, uh, the amoeba, uh, in our calculations. Um, so those are the three main aerobic ones that we're looking for. Um, the last protozoan that we actually count, which lets us know if our system's going in the wrong direction, are ciliates. Um, ciliates are very easy to see. Um, they're usually the most fun to watch because they have, they're, they're like um, little speedy gazellas. They, they go from spot to spot in a real linear fashion. They're moving so fast under your microscope um, that you're just, you're, you're trying to, to just catch up with them and, and watch what they're doing. They're fun to watch. But uh, too many under your microscope slide, if you're seeing one, two, that's typically fine. But if you're seeing five, six, seven under a field of view in a drop, um, your system's starting to go anaerobic. And that's the creature, the protozoan creature, we, we look to make sure that we're not going um, anaerobic. Yeah, I was watching your microscope videos on your channel and exactly what you were explaining is what I saw in the videos, especially the, the blob you mentioned. It's like, it's pretty crazy to see, like there's no actual like shape of the, like the shape of the body just changes. It's just a blob. It's, it's like you said, difficult to see. I thought that was like super interesting once I saw that one. Now, one thing I noticed is that protozoa in particular, when we get into microbial inoculants, and I do have a question for you later on, on microbial inoculants, but not many microbial inoculants on the market actually have protozoa. Is there any reason why that would be the case? Um, it's probably because a lot of people actually are struggle to find protozoa. They're one of the most important creatures when it comes to our solar systems, but finding them and getting to them to reproduce and propagate in a controlled system is actually kind of difficult. Um, once you have them, you want to make sure that they're alive and, and replicating uh, through binary fission, uh, which is essentially them splitting into another one. Um, they, they re reproduce asexually. So, um, as soon as they have enough, uh, food and they're, they're in that system, they just start to reproduce and split into, uh, multiple other ones. But, um, why they're not in certain inoculants, it's hard to say. Um, I, I, I maybe there's a, a transportation issue or them going into dormancy that makes it hard. Um, I, I, I personally haven't done a whole lot of reviews on people's, uh, microbial inoculations, uh, or products. If people want to send them to me, uh, I'd be happy to review them. Um, obviously it goes under pretty strict protocols when we do that. Um, so if anybody's game, sure, send them to me and, uh, and I'll, I'll do as many assessments as I can and try to help. And, and that's the majority of what we try to do as, um, as lab techs and eventually consultants is uh, we actually do uh, not just working with farmers uh, and agricultural production. Uh, we work a lot with uh, compost and compost producers, which are essentially um, kind of, you know, the inoculation um, products that a lot of people are trying to produce. I imagine that some of these living soil systems might be lacking in protozoa potentially. I'm just uh, a little theory here because they're inoculating with bacteria and fungi and nematodes. And But yeah, the protozoa, like we just talked about, it's somewhat rare in these microbial inoculants. So who knows? It might, it might be rare in the system. It could be thrown off a balance of the soil food web. Not really sure. But that brings us into our next microorganism, which is nematodes or nematodes. Tomatoes, tomatoes, right? <laughs> yeah. Talk to us about nematodes. So nematodes uh, are another important creature. Um, again, when you're talking about all these different predatory species, the the more the merrier. Um, it brings more diversity into your soil systems, which again is going to create just another um, layer of creatures that are going to provide certain nutrition for your plant that maybe some other ones that do waste certain nutrients 
may not provide. So having uh, kind of a mixed bag of all the different kinds of predatory species is really important. Uh, nematodes, we typically will uh, do that in the first part of our assessment um, to see how many that we have and what kinds that we have, because uh, there's essentially five. Uh, we have bacterial, which um, we identify all of these creatures by their digestive and mouth parts at 400 magnification. Um, bacteria typically will have a uh, cylindrical mouth with uh, like a dual pumping system to pump bacteria in. Um, there's fungal feeders, which essentially they have um, a spear that comes out of their mouth. And that spear is obviously used to uh, go into the uh, fungal bodies and then extract the nutrients from it. Um, fungal feeders um, typically will have a, kind of some kind of pumping structure, a single pumping structure in their digestive system. Um, there's also root feeders, which are the ones we don't want in our system. Uh, we recognize those by uh, a similar spear that they have, but um, the there's an appendage at the bottom of the spear that looks a lot like um, uh, male medicinal plant parts at the at the at the base of it, uh, um, and so those are the ones that we don't want in our system. Um, or we, if we do see those in the system, we want to make sure that we see predatory species that are going to consume those uh, to balance out uh, their damage that they may do to any root systems near our plants. Um, and the last ones are omnivores. They essentially will eat anything that fits into their mouth. Um, predatory species are the largest. And so we do things, um, we have a couple of procedures in the soil food web where we can do either protozoan infusions or nematode infusions. And we use a specific way of using, uh, nematodes in a soil solution or a water solution. And we actually suspend it and predatory species are, are the biggest and they're also the heaviest. So they sink to the bottom the fastest. So it's kind of a way that we can kind of select for predatory species uh, exclusively and then inject that into our system if we see the presence of root feeders. It's pretty much endless when it comes to talking about microbes and there's just so many different species. I mean, here we're just kind of scratching the surface a little bit. I know when we talk to scientists, we don't know of all the microbes out there, right? There are some that we haven't even identified yet. Yeah. So uh, it, it's really a field where you can just continue to learn and continue to learn and continue to learn for the rest of your life. And uh, that's one thing that really makes it exciting and fascinating mm -hmm. to me, at least. And uh, that's definitely an area where I plan to spend some time in researching and getting deeper and learning more. So I might actually take Dr. Elaine's course on that one because it seems like there's a lot of great information that she shares with her students there. So, but let's flip it up. Let's talk about composting. And I know there's one type of composting in particular that you wanted to get deeper into, thermophilic composting. Can you talk to us about what is thermophilic composting? Yeah. So thermophilic composting is the main composting method we use for one of our biggest tools, which is compost. Uh, our two big tools that we use for um, replenishing systems is compost and a microscope. So we use compost to make sure we're getting uh, what we call biocomplete compost, which is the compost that has all the creatures that we want, the bacteria, the fungi, the nematodes, the protozoa, and everything in there to perpetuate more life. And then we use our microscope to measure if that's going in the right direction and more are being created uh, within our soil systems or are they dropping off for some reason? Is something else happening? When it comes to thermophilic compost, uh, the reason why we're doing thermophilic compost is because what we want to do with that compost is heat it in a specific manner. And there is essentially a schedule to this that we're trying to abide by, but we're trying to get above 131 degrees Fahrenheit for at least a three day period. Um, in that process, we are uh, essentially killing pathogens, pests, um, so pests that may be in our, our compost that may have got introduced somehow through some organic matter, and then also weed seeds. So whenever you're bringing compost and mixing it all together, you're going to get you know some kinds of weed seeds in there, or grass seeds or something else you really don't want. And that thermophilic process, essentially um, having... Uh, three days of, of cooking time will kill the undesirables um, while also being able to maintain certain oxygen levels, which we're usually shooting for a 50% moisture ratio, um, is enough oxygen so that the good guys start uh, reproducing and we start building a lot of them. And then all the 
pathogenic or bad guys are starting to die off. Um, in some cases, they'll go dormant, um, but essentially uh, um, their numbers are, are getting uh, cut further and further down. So we're essentially selecting for the best microbes by using this schedule of getting it hot, uh, three days between turning at at least 131 degrees Fahrenheit uh, below 170 degrees Fahrenheit um, with a specific schedule to each turn. And then when we turn the pile, we turn the pile in a specific manner that essentially we, we, we segregate it into three sections. So we have the top, the middle, and then the bottom. So whenever we've reached that three day, 131 at least uh, uh, Fahrenheit temperature, uh, we take the top off the pile and we use kind of a wire cage to keep it in a very a uniform cylinder. We take the top off and we set it aside. We take the middle and the middle becomes the new bottom. After that, the top becomes the new middle and then the bottom becomes the new top. We do that process three times and then everything, every third has, has mixed equally in each area of the, of the pile. And so that's how we know that our compost is homogenous, at least at that point. Um, some people that are shooting for USDA certified uh, will have to do two more turns and have a total of five turns to have USDA certified compost. Okay, and then thermophilic compost, is this something that can be done in like a bin in the garage? Like I'm doing vermicompost right now. I have a, a small bin in my garage and I'm able to add things in and there's worms in there and, and so on and so forth. Thermophilic composting, can that be done inside in a bin or is this should certainly be done outside in a pile? Dr. Lane shows us uh, typically in a barn on like a, a concrete uh, floor. What they'll typically do is, is have some kind of tarp to catch all the catchings of the stuff that'll fall. And then she'll have a pallet on top of that and then wire mesh surrounding the pile. So yeah, you could certainly do it in a space inside of a garage. Now you want to make, you want to make sure that your moisture content is 50% and not too high or too low below that. Um, when you can fill moisture and, uh, we call, we do what's called a field test and, um, you grab your compost or your ingredients to compost when you're first starting. And if it feels wet, but it doesn't stick together, you're about 30% uh, moisture. If it feels wet and you squeeze it and it, it clumps together, but you don't get any drops out of your hands, you're about 40%. Uh, when you squeeze it and you get maybe one drop uh, pulled up within your hand, um, you're looking at 50%. Obviously, from that point, you get a, a couple drops out, you're 60, you get multiple drops, 70. And then if you're getting lots of water coming out, then you're getting closer to 100% moisture. Being able to have that pile be aerobic using the wire and then having a pallet underneath is what you want the pile to be. You want air to be able to travel in and out of it. If you're in a dry climate like I am, I, I actually wrap it in plastic to keep the moisture inside because I actually have an issue with losing moisture uh, in my area. If you're in a real tropical or humid environment, uh, you'd probably not cover it at all. You'd probably just leave it uh, out in the open with just with uh, something to catch uh, everything falling underneath it. But you'd probably want to make sure that um, you're getting more air, uh, not less air like I would need to in our desert climate. Okay, and then what do you put in the pile to begin? Like, how do you start this pile? And then what can you put into the pile as you go along? And what should you not put in the pile? So once you have all your ingredients, you actually want to build a pile that's approximately three feet high by three feet tall is kind of the base to what we do. And the reason why we do that is because that's kind of the minimum size that you want in order to generate the kinds of temperatures that we're looking to do. So again, um, if you're doing inside the house, you just want to make sure that your temperature, you're monitoring your temperatures because a pile can get over 180 degrees, depending on how much nitrogen you add to the, to the pile itself. But once you build a pile, you don't want to continue adding things to it. Um, there's different, uh, composting like static composting where you do add things over time, but with thermophilic composting, it's kind of, um, it's like making, uh, you know, bread or a recipe of baking. You, you don't continually add stuff to the, the batter after you you've started the cooking process. And so the three components you want to add to your compost pile is going to be carbon, a nitrogen source and a high nitrogen source. Uh, the more carbon diversity you can get, the better. So I'm actually going to be starting some um, 
of my consultant training soon, and we're um, compiling all the different ingredients I need for my compost. And so I'm using um, wood chips as a large portion of what would be considered 60% of the pile. Um, I'm also adding in paper shreddings, so recycled paper, and then I'm also adding in recycled cardboard, which is a little thicker. Um, I'm only adding, uh, I would consider it six parts or six wheelbarrows is how I use it. So uh, six wheelbarrows equals, equals my 60% of the pile that I need. Um, and, and that's, it's a pretty good ratio of volume in order to get the size of the pile you need for the carbon side. Um, and so you want the three different foods in there because fungi, you'll get more diversity if you have different kinds of foods that are uh, homogenous within that carbon source. The second ingredient you're going to want to have is your green material or your nitrogen. Um, this could be uh, any kind of silage. It, be, it could be, you know, cut grass, grass clippings. Um, it could be trimmings off your plants or trees, um, weeds. If you're pulling weeds and you have all this you know, you know, uh, bag of weeds, instead of throwing it away to go to the landfill, you can actually use that as your nitrogen component to your, your compost system. Um, the last one that we use is uh, high nitrogen. And, uh, so the carbon is the fungal resource or fungal foods. The nitrogen essentially is bacteria food, but the nitrogen or the green material actually helps keep our temperatures, um, uh, up where they need to be for an extended period of time. So it's kind of like the, um, it's kind of like the fuel that keeps the fire going for a, a specific period. The nitrogen is kind of like the lighter fluid. It gets everything started quickly. And that's typically uh, we're use it either using manure or if you're wanting to do like a vegan pile, um, you can use uh, alfalfa. Um, typically, um, you want to use something that's fairly fresh alfalfa in order to put into the pile. And also alfalfa, depending on... Um, if you have nitrifying bacteria or rhizobacteria within the root system of that alfalfa, that's going to be really high, uh, nitrogen ratio. So you want to get those things equally mixed all together in the pile with that 50% moisture, uh, and, and essentially, uh, evenly mixed throughout the pile in order to make sure that everything cooks, um, the same throughout the entire process. Okay. And then what tools do you need for this? I mean, you mentioned monitoring the temperature or using a temperature gun for this or using one of those temperature like that have the probes like used for cooking, for example, I have one of those, do you stick that into the pile? And then also for, you mentioned turning the pile, is that just like your traditional pitchfork or, or what tools are needed for this? So yeah, um, you'll want some type of uh uh, cage wire. Um, you can use really any kind of cage wire that will get you that three by three cylinder. Um, we usually put it on a recycled pallet. Uh, and then again, a tarp underneath, uh, when we turn the pile, we definitely use pitchforks cause it makes it much easier when things are stuck together to turn and put parts of the pile here and there. Um, I use, uh, some Rio temp, uh, compost thermometers and you want to make sure you get one that's long enough to reach the center of the pile. So, um, when we're monitoring temperatures, uh, what we typically do is we'll measure to the center of the pile, uh, using our, our compost thermometer, and then just kind of push it in and hold our finger there so that we make sure that we get the tip, which is where the probe is, uh, in the center of the pile. Okay. And then at what point is the compost ready to be used in your garden? So, um, you're going to do that turning process. And again, if you're, if you're separating it into thirds, you want three turns and then everything's mixed evenly. If you're hitting that 131 degree temperature throughout a three day period between turns, um, then, uh, which obviously that amount of time between turns, uh, uh, speeds up. If your pile gets up to 145 or 155, uh, your, your timeline of three days, you know, gets down to two. And then if you're at 165 degrees by the first day, after the first day of assembling the pile, you got 24 hours, you can turn it. Um, but, and after you turn it three times, sometimes it'll take up to five turns, depending on how much nitrogen you have in the pile. But once it starts to cool and it, it drops below, uh, that 131 degrees and starts to fall into that 80 degree, uh, temperature, uh, at that point, your compost is pretty much ready to, to use at that point. Um, you could always test it out to make sure you're not getting any specific hot spots within the pile, or you can kind of mix it a little bit, a little bit more. Um, once you essentially have finished cooking and turning it, 
Um, but that, at that point I've used, I've used my compost with a little bit of, um, you know, either dirt from outside or some bagged, uh, soil that we may have just lying around. And I've thrown seeds directly into that and they don't get burnt. Um, they actually grow really well and they all, they have already all those organisms around them once they're starting to germinate that are actually going to help them continue, uh, the rest of their production. So it's a pretty relatively quick process uh, turnaround time there. Now, are you, since you have a microscope, are you actually taking a sample of that and looking under the microscope before you add it into your plants, for example, or, you know, top dressing or whatever? I am. I am. And and the main reason why I'm doing that is because I'm trying to make sure that um, even even I will make a mistake and, and have a situation where part of the compost maybe went anaerobic or I put it into storage and it didn't quite um, – maybe the top is aerobic, but the bottom's anaerobic. And so, yeah, I'll typically do a periodic check um, using my um, test tubes, which you can watch the videos to know how to do a sample and uh, kind of look in there and just make sure the organisms that I'm seeing – are um, all aerobic. I'm not seeing a whole bunch of ciliates or uh, pathogenic uh, bacteria or omycetes, uh, which are the fungi that are typically, when you look at them under the microscope, uh, the difference between a, an, an aerobic and an anaerobic fungi, aerobic are usually have some type of color. Their structures are uniform in diameter, and they typically have what's called septation, what looks like these little like cross walls as you're looking at the structure that are kind of separating it into like these almost looks like a, like it was specifically measured and they're like all one inch apart. So uniform septation as well. Those are aerobic creatures. Um, typically the ends of where their tip cell is, is usually flat. Um, so it's very uh, uniform looking creature that ends up being a, a soil organism. But when you get into omycetes, the bad stuff, they look like um, almost like a like a cactus uh, under the microscope. They're wispy, so they have like a lot of structures that are going all in different directions. Their structures are lumpy and bumpy. It look kind of like bubbly. They don't have uh, usually color. They're usually colorless. Um, their uh, diameters are usually on the smaller side, and it's nothing's uniform about it. It's, it's basically it looks like a like a fungal strain but it's it's chaotic. It's not as structured as an aerobic fungi would be. I need to get my hands on a microscope ASAP because I'm just, uh, it, it makes me wonder like how many bad bacteria I have in my system, you know, and you, you don't know unless you have a microscope. So that's definitely something I'm going to have to pick up in the future. So I want to circle back to microbial inoculants for a minute here. There are so many people now using microbial inoculants. And like we mentioned earlier, it's a lot of bacteria and fungi. Some have nematodes in them as well, but a lot of people are overusing it you know, they're, they're applying it way more than they should. I imagine that there's an imbalance in the soil food web that could potentially be causing some sort of damage. But I want to open up this question to you and just kind of big, a big broad question here is what advice do you have for someone who's using microbial inoculants? If you're not investing into a microscope and you're just adding things into a soil system, um, it is guesswork, but you can still experiment on the amounts that you're, you're giving to the plants. Uh, what will happen is if you're, you don't have enough organic material within your soil system, those inoculants that you're adding, um, they won't have enough food to survive, so they'll basically just die. Um, that decay process could lead to something that's anaerobic. Um, but again, without a microscope, it's, it's, it's more or less trial and error. So it is kind of a longer process, but what I would do is if you're using – uh, microbial inoculants without a microscope, um, record how much you're using and the effect that it has on the plant. And you can either increase or decrease de depending on how the plant reacts. Uh, in some cases, some plants will react better than others, even if it's the same species of plant. So it, it's not always an exact science if you don't have all the data that you're um, able to quantify. So again, it's one of those things that I would, I would create a log book. I would see what uh, your plants are doing, how they react, how certain plants react, because um, some different cultivars may want more than others or react different than others. Um, but if you can get your hands on a microscope and you can use that same data set and data uh, logs with a microscope, even if you 
can just use some of my videos and just recognize what you're looking at and being able to say like, okay, I see more activity now than I did um, a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, so the, the microbes are starting to um, self-sustain in this system and they're doing well. It's just another tool in your tool belt to be able to measure the success of what you're doing with your plants. Uh, even if you're just a novice at using um, the microscope, everybody can take notes and kind of track where they're going from that point. I think that's some really good advice, man. You revealed so much good information in this podcast episode. I mean, we could go on and on and on and talk more and more and more, but we're going to wrap things up here. Tell us, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? So you can find me on YouTube uh, at K space, the guy, one word. Um, I'm also on Instagram. Uh, I'm trying to do more, but uh, K underscore the guy. Uh, I'm currently working on the final three stages of my consultancy program for the Soul Food Web. And uh, I'm going to be doing more composting videos, extract videos, tea videos on that entire process. And in order to get my certification, I have to take a, a part of land that's devoid of, of uh, essentially activity, uh, biological activity, and I have to turn it into one that's um, – full of life and full of different activity. And so that process is actually, um, it's, it's not that easy. It actually takes months at a time sometimes in order to do so people can more or less get to follow along with uh, what I'm doing uh, on all the different inoculations and building compost and how to bring life back into soil systems. Awesome. Well, like I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, I'll definitely have a link to your channel down in the YouTube description section below. And if you're on one of the podcast platforms, just search for him, K the guy. You'll find him. He'll pop up right up on YouTube search results. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing one of these podcast episodes, and I would love for you to tune into future episodes. Kay, thanks so much for coming on. This has been insightful for me, and I'm sure it's insightful for my audience as well. Definitely appreciate you dropping the knowledge that you dropped, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Peace out, everyone.